Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back uh, from our little break. Um, right now we'll have David Park, uh, DO, from Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Southern Utah campus. Um, and thank you for, to Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine for sponsoring David Park um, in his lecture. Um, I, he will be speaking on undergraduate medical education, which is especially pertinent for us uh, now here in, in Utah. So, hey David. So I know the title printed in your program says Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine, but I did not want to make this a commercial about this medical school. Uh, I wanted to make sure that there was, it was CME relevant. And so I changed the title a little bit on my slide because and I had this flash of brilliance and creativity. So I titled it, Bridging Healthcare to the World Through Undergraduate Medical Education. Hello everyone, my name is David Park. I'm an osteopathic family physician. Uh, I'll, I'll just very briefly tell you a little bit about myself. I've been in academic medicine my entire career, um, but before then I was born in Seoul, South Korea, immigrated to New York when I was four, and I spent over 30 years living in New York City. Did all of my education there. My first job uh, was on faculty for the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I was doing that for four years, and then moved over to Las Vegas, and uh, former program director in family medicine for nine years, chair of family medicine, faculty, assistant dean of GME, and, and various things. So I've really been in academic medicine my entire uh, professional career. And I'm here with you today uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to very briefly introduce you to Utah's second medical school. But also, more importantly, I wanted to, you, to give you as, as healthcare providers uh, a, a, a look at where we are in undergraduate medical education in the country and also here specifically in Utah. So the objective is that at the end of this talk you'll have a better understanding of the different models of undergraduate medical education and also to understand a little bit about the fiscal requirements of operating an osteopathic medical school. Now when I got invited to give this talk, um, there was some interest on, tell, tell us how a medical school runs and operates. There was some interest in that, so I'll touch upon that just a little bit. But also I'll spend a lot of time talking about the demographics of our current medical students. And we'll talk about clinical training opportunities in uh, residency and GME. Okay. Now before we talk about the medical education system, I want to take a step back and just kind of <clears throat> give you a broad view of um, the current medical education system in the United States. So we have undergraduate medical education, med school. First two years are spent in the classrooms and labs. We call that the preclinical years. And then the third and fourth years are done typically in hospitals and community uh, offices. Now, Traditional MD schools have done a hospital-based type clinical education, and osteopathic medical schools have traditionally done community-based preceptorship models. And if you, it's really interesting, if you look back at the history of osteopathic medicine, um, which was started actually by an MD in the United States, you know, over 125 years ago, um, it took a lot f for DOs to get accepted and privileged in hospitals um, and in various different states. Now, I'm sure all of you know, um, all 50 states, full license, full license to practice the full scope of medicine. But anyway, that's how it, they started. They couldn't get into the hospital system, and so the DOs had no choice but to rely on community physicians. And interestingly enough, there was a quite of uh, interest from community doctors to have apprentices um, to help them in their practice and do that training. So that model still sticks now, and that uh, has now grown, and a lot of allopathic medical schools now are also using the community preceptorship model. Why? Because it's a lot more cost effective than running an entire hospital or hospital system to train medical students. 
Well, anyway, so after undergraduate medical education, we go on to GME and then move on to CME, which we're doing right now. But stepping back a little bit further, I want to talk about what is the end product? What is the end product of medical school? What is the end product of what we're doing right now? And it really, when I think about it, it comes down to three main categories. It's what we do is, one, to prevent premature death. Number two is to prevent premature disability. And number three is to improve quality of life. And that's through managing pain, managing depression, anxiety, and the various other things. And intertwined in all three of these categories are spatterings of humanism, of compassionate listening, reassurance, and guidance that we give to our patients. So that's the overall arching goal, and that will be the product of what we want to do, of create. And so that's the medical education system. Now, more specifically about the title of our program and to talk about undergraduate medical education, AKA medical school. Now I know there's PAs and nurse practitioners and other allied health professionals, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more focused on medical schools at this time. And there's the traditional allopathic medical school, the MD degree. And there's other institutions of medical education that provides the DO degree, which stands for Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine. There, in the organizational structure of things, there's the public nonprofit, like the University of Utah. And then there's the private nonprofit organizations. And there's uh, various medical schools that way um, with that type of tax structure. And that's what the nonprofit is it's a tax structure. And then there's the private non nonprofit. And the reason I'm saying non nonprofit instead of for profit is because for some strange reason, when it comes to Edu higher education and medical education, for-profit entities seems to get demonized for some reason. And what's really interesting is the hospital systems in the United States at one point were all nonprofit. And then when the first for-profit hospital emerged, once again, they were demonized. But through the course of time, did you know that now five for-profit hospital systems HCA, Tenet, Extension Health, and others, they run over 450 acute care hospitals in the United States, and arguably some of them are considered the most profitable and, and successful. So in this day and age, in the United States of America, you know, based on, on capitalism, um, you know, that's where health care is actually kind of going. Um, is that good or bad? I don't know, but I've worked at public nonprofits and private nonprofits and private for profits, and I'll tell you, when it comes down to operations and the business model, budgeting, spending, every single one of those entities has to operate in the black. So the business model of any organization, regardless of the structure of the tax structure, is pretty much the same. Now, there's also the U.S. accredited schools, so the allopathic medical schools are accredited. They're all under the Department of Education of the U.S. government by the LCME, the Liaison Committee of Medical Education. And on the osteopathic side, the accrediting agency, the acronym is COCA, Commission of Osteopathic Colleges Accreditation. Now, those are the two U.S. entities accrediting entities that can accredit U.S. medical schools. Now, there are a lot of foreign medical schools. It's estimated that just in the Caribbean islands alone, there's about 50-plus medical schools in the Caribbean. Now, there's the top-tiered ones, and there's the many lower-tiered lower ones. And the non-U.S. accredited medical schools are typically accredited by the local government or by the, by the country. Okay. Um, now, I'm not talking about Canada, England, or, or others. Um, they all have separate accreditation systems, but we look at here in the United States for U.S. accredited medical schools. Now, how do you operate a medical school? Well, undergraduate medical education is funded five different ways. And depending on what tax structure or business model we look at, it pretty much comes down to, to pretty much all the same stuff. 
the number one source of funding for education is the student themselves. They take out loans. If their family can help, they help. But by and large, the student typically takes out loans and funds the medical school themselves. Now, according to the AAMC 2017 uh, survey, they say they estimate that 75% of medical school graduates will graduate with a debt load, the median debt load of 192,000 a year. Okay? At Rocky Vista, we're about 240,000 a year. Now, medical school is expensive. NYU just very recently announced that medical school tuition is free for all of their students. Well, who's paying for that? NYU's tuition every year is $55,000 a year. Well, who's paying for that? Well, the tuition is free. It's being paid for by, uh, by donations. So Ken Langone, co-founder of Home Depot, um, has him and his colleagues and others have raised $400 million $450 million out of the $600 million projected goal, and that's how they're paying for the medical students. So this contribution, this fundraising, has to continue perpetually if they're going to have their students uh, um, have their tuition free. Now, obviously, living in New York City is very expensive. The students, besides tuition, still has to take out loans to pay for the thirty dollars to $50,000 of housing and food. Running a medical school is extremely expensive. Um, Harvard Medical School, they have operated in a deficit for the past nine, nine years. And this is straight out of their crimson on their website. They're at a deficit so far of $44 million in operating costs for their medical school, Harvard's medical school. Now, how do medical schools how does Harvard or other medical schools come up with, with, the, with the funding? Well, there's other ways, and I'll go through number two, three, four, and five. So the state, if you're a, a public entity like the University of Utah, you will get some state funding. But that state funding is pretty small in amount of what's actually needed to run that type of an enterprise. Um, Harvard and other medical schools, that their, their medical school is typically subsidized by the clinical enterprise of the medical school. Okay? The clinician faculty members that are drawing in dollars to their health system. Okay? And also by, by um, endowments. Harvard's endowment is huge. And that's how they were, are able to operate with that type of funds. But the medical school itself, based on tuition and others, just can't operate alone. Now, the federal government does fund it by having scholarships. Uh, at Rocky Vista, there's a, a lot of students that take the HPSB, the Health Professional Service uh, Program Scholarship, where the military will pay for all four years of medical school, um, giving them a stipend while in medical school, but owing, uh, expecting years of service afterwards. It's a very attractive offer for students to come out of medical school debt-free get great training uh, in the military and have some phenomenal experiences during your residency training uh, and afterwards. And then sometimes medical schools chip in and pay some money for tuition reduction, scholarships, and so forth. But oftentimes a lot of donors, all the scholarships that you hear about that students get, they're not necessarily from medical school themselves. It's from donors. And they're able, if you're a nonprofit organization, you're able to get donations from others. For-profit schools will not be asking any of the alumni or any of you for, for donations. It's just not allowed to do that. Okay. So that is the fiscal requirements and how th we operate as, a, as an organization. Question yes, sir. That's a, that's a great point that it raises. The question is, on my last statement, are for-profits allowed to take donations? Um, and I guess technically they are, but for-profits are not allowed to give a receipt back to the donor um, to say that uh, um, you can get tax deductions. With that said, um, in our administration, um, executives, deans, we are at least at our school, and I know for other schools, are not allowed to hit the road asking for donations. It's just we don't see it as the right thing to do. Okay. 
All right, so now I want to talk about the landscape of the medical school applicants and, uh, and who's going into medical school these days. Now, this is a compilation of both MD schools and DO schools. Now, in the app, if you look at the applicants, there's uh, almost 53,000 applicants uh, for MD schools and about 21,000 applicants to DO schools. And you can see the matriculants is 21,622 for MDs and 7,415 for DOs. Now look at their science GPAs. For MDs, according to the AAMC and AACOM's data, um, the science GPA for MDs is 3.65, higher uh, than, the, than the DOs, 3.43. The total GPA for MD schools is 3.72 on average, and for DOs is 3.54. And the MCAT scores typically are higher for MD schools, 511.2 uh, to 503.8. Went from a, about uh, three years ago, they went to the MCATs, went from a two digit score for what you're familiar with to a three digit score. So n now the, the common you know, the thought is well, it's harder to get into MD school. Um, if, you're, if you can't get into MD school, you can go to DO school. Well, there's, there's truth to that, but it's not all just based on numbers, right? And so, um, I will. I want to now go on to the next point, and I'll talk a little bit about those numbers when I talk about Rocky Vista specifically. But moving on to medical school demographics. Now, you don't have to look at this slide and, and uh, look at what these uh, charts say. But this is total enrollment in U.S. medical schools based on race and ethnicity. Now, I'll just point out that the top bar are for the MD students, and the bottom bar is the data for the DO students. So out of 91,391 total enrolled MD medical students uh, last year, 46,610 were white. Okay? So that's about 51% were white, which means 49% of the MD medical student body are of different or mixed ethnicities. In the DOs, you'll see that number is about 60% white and about 40% different ethnicities. Now, another interesting thing is what about women? Uh, more and more women are applying to medical school. As a matter of fact, in, in 2004, that is when female applicants to medical school overtook male applicants. 2004, there were more female applicants to medical school than men. It was not until, until 2017 that there were actually more female matriculants than males. So for the past two years, there are more females in medical school, okay, at least on the allopathic side, than there are in males. And even in Utah, it's, I think it was 50.4% uh, uh, females versus uh, males. So there is definitely a change in the demographics of medical students and future physician workforce in this state and in this country. Okay. Now this is, slide is just for fun, the double ACOM, which is the Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, they put out a list of the top 20 feeder colleges ranked in order of applicants. And if you, you can't see everything here, but number five is Brigham Young University. Um, top in the top five. Now, University of Utah is not on here on the top 20 list. I don't know. They may be 21. Um, but for all, now, one, one of the things I've learned here pretty quickly coming from uh, New York and, and Nevada was there's something called a holy war uh, in, in Utah. So for uh, all the blue fans, uh, at least uh, <clears throat> BYU win, wins uh, this one, at least for that. The osteopathic medical profession is growing. Osteopathic medical schools are growing, and osteopathic students' classes and bodies are growing. Now, there are th currently 35 colleges of osteopathic medicine operating now on 55 different teaching locations as of April's last COCA meeting. So that means one in four medical students right now are in osteopathic medical schools. 
Now, why do they go into osteopathic medical schools? Well, yes, it's true. Some of them couldn't get into allopathic medical schools, wanted to stay in the United States, wants to stay in a certain state, um, and they can go there. But there's also a lot of others that, that you know, identify with the osteopathic holistic view. There's many others that uh, like to learn the additional manipulation that DOs learn in undergraduate medical education to treat their patients. Um, I, as a family doctor, I work in the emergency department, and I have a patient that comes in with a severe upper back pain. And instead of x-rays and narcotics and an NSAID prescription to go home, I can spend a few minutes and do some things Okay. find the vertebra or the rib that's out of position and push it back into, into a position, and the patient walks out pain-free without a prescription. Okay. That, that's one of the benefits that uh, as, you know, DOs have in our tool bag. And the cool thing about this is with the single accreditation system now where all residencies, MDs, and DOs are now combined, Last year, we just had the last match, MD and DO match. Now, there's going to be a single match. Now, allopathic residency programs have the option to include osteopathic medical education into their residency programs. They can get osteopathically recognized, and so MD residents can now learn osteopathic manipulation and incorporate that into their practice in the future, should they want to. Okay. Now, before I go on to, to this slide, how many of you <clears throat> remember applying to medical school, PA school, professional school back in the day? If you think about your GPA, um, about your competition, can you remember before we talked about uh, nearly 53,000 applicants to MD schools? Okay. Well, I'm going to go back 30 years, which is around the time where I was applying to medical school, and in 1989, 30 years, there were only 27,000 applicants to medical school at that time. So what's interesting is that the interest and demand for medical school continues to rise, and so with the expansion of medical school classes, um, you know, th there's definitely a need and a demand for it. Now obviously, to get our medical students into the physician workforce where they're needed mostly, the rate limiting step right now is GME training, and that's a topic uh, for a whole another day. Okay. Now, Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine, just as a brief introduction, um, the, these are the statistics of our current class in southern Utah. Okay. So the class of 2021, these are our current second year students. And the class of 2022 are our current first-year students. And I put the references down here. So you'll see that our students here are higher than the national average for GPA and MCATs for the osteopathic schools. And they're getting pretty close, at least on our southern Utah campus um, for Rocky Vista, getting pretty close to, the, uh, to some of the MD schools. And as I was mentioning before, is it harder to get into an MD school? It's a yes and no answer. But then the question is this. There's a .07 difference in science GPA between 3.58 and 3.65. Is that really going to make a difference as a doctor if they're going to be taking care of you or your family members? Does that small difference in GPA make them less caliber of, as a physician. Now we know that for those of you that done residency, residency is where you really, really learn the art of medicine. And what is this test? This tests um, standardized testing and it may test knowledge. Okay? Now of the core competencies, medical knowledge is, o is only one of six of the core competencies. There's interprofessional communication, professionalism, and various other things. So I would argue that I don't think it really makes a big difference. I don't think those numbers make one doctor better uh, than another. Okay? And University of Utah School of Medicine is an, is an excellent program. My, my son wants to go to medical school, and if he gets accepted there, uh, what a blessing that, that would be. Um, I'm not going to 
pressure him either way to go which way he wants to go, but if he gets in, into that school, that, that's fantastic. State school with state tuition, um, it, it's, it's fantastic. Now, I, I think we need to get out of this game of competition of who's better than who, DOs and MDs. I think those days are pretty much gone for the most part. Well, you know, I um, did a health policy fellowship and I work on legislative stuff both locally as well as federally, and the whole scope of practice issue between MDs and DOs, it doesn't exist anymore. Now, there's battles with other you know, providers when it comes to scope of practice, but amongst DOs and MDs, it, it's, it's a non-issue. Uh, and I think we'll eventually begin to see some type of compromise and working together with the other allied health professions, because bottom line, IPE, as you've heard multiple times throughout today, interprofessional education, healthcare is becoming more team-based and it's becoming population-based as opposed to individual one-on-one -on -one transactions. Well, anyway, so I just wanted to share with you what our classes, classes look like right now. And, you know, one of the common questions I get, you know, I've been working uh, with Rocky Vista now for four years trying to get this campus, campus up and running. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but I, I am the, the dean of the uh, osteopathic school campus in Ivins. And one of the most common questions that I would get from community physicians is, where are you going to where and how are you going to train your medical students in the third year? I'm sure many of you may be thinking that as well. Well, I think the underlying question is, is there enough capacity to train all the Utah medical students here in Utah? Okay. So I'll address that question. So right now, University of Utah, they have, they're approved for 125 students. And about 72% of those students are actually in-state students. That, that's fantastic, and it, it's a no-brainer. Um, what's also interesting about Rocky Vista students is we also are approved for 125 students per year, and 55% of our students are in-state. So as a, as a private institution, we have no uh, state regulations on how many students we must take from in-state. But these are the students that, that really shine. There's a lot of excellent students uh, from Utah. And so next year, well, as a matter of fact, um, in about 11 months, when our second, current second year students are going out into the community doing rotations, um, there's 125 students from University of Utah potentially doing rotations, 125 students around, uh, around that number from, from uh, Rocky Vista, and about 40 students roughly from other, other schools. Now there's, I know many of you are preceptors for us, well I thank you for that, and I know many of you are preceptors for students from other schools, Arizona, Kirksville, uh, whatever, and, uh, there's a, and the reason for that is because there are a lot of students from Utah that went to University of Utah, or BYU, Southern Utah University, that couldn't get into University of Utah or couldn't get into our school, but they still want to go to medical school, so they'll go out of state and then in the third years, they, they want to come back and do their rotations. So there's about 40-ish students from other schools that are currently doing rotations uh, around Utah. So we're talking 40, 50 students. So uh, we're talking 250, maybe 300 students that will be doing their clinical preceptorships here in Utah. Now, I'm going to share with you some numbers. Uh, in my most recent meeting with, um, with the bureau manager of, of Doppel, um, he shared with me that there's over 10,000 licensed physicians in Utah. Now, obviously, of the 10,000 physicians, uh, Larry Marks is, is his name, uh, we know that not all of them will practice medicine here in Utah, but he estimates that it's over 7,000 of those doctors practice in Utah because they have Utah addresses. Now, I want to point to a number down here you can't see well, and this is according to the AAMC, U.S. Medical School Faculty by Medical Schools in 2018. It says here, the University of Utah School of Medicine, 1,687 clinical faculty members. This is on the website of the AAMC. Um, with seven, over 7,000 practicing physicians, with nearly 1,700 University of Utah clinical faculty, and Rocky Vista, currently, we have 229 
physician, community physicians signed up as our uh, adjunct clinical faculty to train our third year students. And it's our hope that that number would increase at least by 10% by the end of this, uh, this meeting. But I believe with these numbers, there's a sufficient number of clinicians and preceptors to train 300 uh, students in, the, in here in Utah. Now, another common question I get is, well, are your students going to get residency? I hear there's a shortage of residency programs. You know, it's ethically and morally right for you to make sure that your students have places to go for residency training. And I agree with that. I agree with that. Now, once again, I put this up here only to show you as a source. But this is um, from the 2018 uh, results of the main residency match. And this is just a page for Utah. So in Utah alone, well, before I go into Utah, let me just share with you, in the United States, do you feel that we, there's a shortage of residency programs in the United States? How many of you feel that there's a shortage of residency programs? Yeah. Um, overall, overall, the answer can be yes. But let me share with you the, the most recent 2019 NRMP report. Okay, the NRMP is the allopathic match, and uh, the AOA is the osteopathic match. Um, 2019 was the last time, as I mentioned before, there's going to be two matches. Next year, there's only going to be one NRMP match, and I have the numbers here in front of me. So there were total available first year PGY-1 slots last year, 33,470. Total active applicants in the... Uh, NRMP and AOA, including MDs, DOs, and international medical graduates, there were 30,376 for a shortage of about, uh, about 5,000, 4,906. Okay? Now, that's including international medical graduates. Let's talk about U.S. medical school graduates. U.S. medical school graduates, MDs, and DOs here in the United States, applicants were 27,290. Seven, which means there was a surplus of 6,174 first-year slots for U.S. grads. Okay. So for U.S. medical school graduates, my students in Colorado, uh, Colorado and in Utah, um, there's, there's a surplus of 6,100 first-year slots in the, in, the, uh, in the match right now. And as I mentioned before, we know that the rate limiting step for a physician workforce increase is GME. And so we are working local level, national levels to try to increase GME funding to increase GME slots. Now, of course, yes, there's you know, over 6,000 uh, available you know, surplus slots for all the MDs and DO graduates here. Of course, if you add on the 11,000 IMG, uh, applicants, then of course there's that 5,000 uh, shortage before. But I'll tell you, working as a previous program director um, and knowing the, the landscape of uh, residency, um, there's a strong preference for U.S. graduates. Now, a lot of those IMGs, though, are U.S. citizens, um, and some of them are, are excellent candidates, and they will continue to get slots. Now, the GME system, we, you know, I talked about that surplus of 6,000. We want every of one of those slots filled because that, again, is our pipeline to our physician workforce. And fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of those uh, rural programs are filled only by IMG applicants. Okay? So what's interesting is in the heartland of America, in the rural America, the vast majority of the residents that are serving and taking care of those community people are, are international medical graduates. Okay. Now let's focus here on, on Utah. Now once again, please don't try to read this. This is just to show you as, as a source. In Utah alone, there are 40 ACGME-approved residency programs okay, with 166 approved first-year residency slots. In Utah alone, there's a very, very good job, 166 programs. Last year, uh, the University of Utah School of Medicine, uh, on their website, now I, they didn't put up their recent uh, match data, but uh, last year, of the 166 slots, um, only you know, 15 of those slots were filled by University of Utah graduates. Okay? 
That means 151 of the first-year residents in Utah are filled by students that went to medical school outside of the state. Okay. So I think uh, there is opportunity for our students here in Utah if they perform well in the clinical rotations with the community physicians, have good scores, will have a darn good chance to get into some of these programs because bottom line is we want them to practice here in our state and take care of our patients and our population here. Okay. Now, Rocky Vista has done well on residency placements and I'll share that with you in a few slides later. Now, the most recent report is um, for the Utah Physician Workforce. Um, it's, from, it's from the AAMC also. And I want to share with you a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> active primary care physicians per population, we rank 49th in the country. That's pretty low. Also, for active general surgeons for the population, Utah ranks dead last. Okay. So we don't do very well in those aspects. We definitely need more primary care physicians in Utah. We definitely need more general surgeons in Utah. Well, there's one area that Utah ranks pretty high. They rank number four in the ratio of residents and fellows to medical students. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me that there's quite some uh, opportunity and some capacity for students to work with residents. To, um, because right now, according to this ratio, rank number four, there's lots and lots and lots of residents, and there's not that many medical students. Um, okay. So we have lots of opportunities, I think, there to connect graduate medical education and undergraduate medical education in collaboration here in the state of Utah. Okay. Now, I'm sure many of you have already figured out by now that there is a second medical school here in Utah. We are the first and only osteopathic medical school here. And we are a fully accredited medical school. Now, just very briefly give you of an overview of the governance. Um, Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine was founded um, in, a den in a suburb of Denver, Colorado, in a city called Parker. It's about 15 minutes away from Denver. And chartered in 2006, first accepted its class of students in 2008. And this Saturday, I'll be hopping on a, f a flight uh, tomorrow, this Saturday we'll be graduating our eighth class of medical students. Okay. And so Rocky Vista has been in operations in Colorado for about 11 years now, and about two years ago launched a new campus in southern Utah. So it's one college of osteopathic medicine operating on two campuses. Some similarity a little bit, not really, but kind of like BYU Utah, BYU Idaho. But the important thing is that we have one shared governance and we have one shared curriculum. So we at Rocky Vista have a proven curriculum from Colorado. We know what works. We've tweaked it and improves every year. And our students in Utah are getting that same proven curriculum that our Colorado students have get. Uh, it is the same exact lectures, same exact examination, and when all the students take their test, they're all graded as one big cohort. 150 students in Colorado, 125 students in Utah, a collective cohort of 275 students. Okay. Now, Rocky Vista didn't just appear here in Utah, there's been a lot, a lot of groundwork that was put in. My boss, the Dr. Thomas Told, um, he couldn't get into the University of Utah and he tells a story. He couldn't get in so he had no choice but to go out of state and he ended up going to uh, an osteopathic medical school out of state and um, back in those days when he got his residency training and everything else, he couldn't DOs couldn't practice in the state of Utah. So although he grew up here and his family was here, he set up shop, private practice in, a, um, uh, in Craig, Colorado, which is right across the border. And it was his dream one day to see an osteopathic medical school here in the state of Utah. So he's been dreaming about this, hoping about this for many years. And when he was the associate dean of clinical education on our Colorado campus, he started coming here, living here also um, since 2012, okay, that's seven years, of 
trying to get an osteopathic medical school here. I was hired in 2015, in July 2015, to help launch the uh, Southern Utah campus. We started construction March 2016, and we launched July 2017. We have our first class of students, as you know, and in about 11 weeks, our second year students now will be rotating in the various regions in Utah getting their clinical education. Um, and we hope that uh, you'll have the opportunity to, to work with them and they'll have the opportunity to, to learn from you. That strong curriculum, uh, I'm sharing with you a report that the dean gets at the end of May. It, sh it tells us uh, where we rank as a medical school uh, compared to all the other osteopathic medical schools in the country um, based on the osteopathic medical licensing examination. You're familiar with the USMLE, the osteopathic uh, version of that is called the COMLEX and take the first one after their second year and take the, the, their second step in the third and fourth year and they take their final step in during residency and you have to pass all three to get a uh, full medical licensure. Well for level one um, out of all the osteopathic medical schools ours is shown in red so we ranked number two. In level two, our school ranked number one, and in level three, ranked number two. We mentioned eight classes of graduates. Um, this is our, our GME placement. We have a track record of excellent GME placement. And if you visit our booth um, outside, there's a folder, and it'll share with you the, t the class of 2019 that's actually graduating on Saturday. It'll, it'll list all the different residency uh, programs that they're going into, from anesthesia, primary care, emergency medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, neurosurgery, orthopedics. It, it's everything. Osteopathic medical school is not just family medicine. So this is how well we do. And that 99%, it was one student, not based on GPA, grades, or, or, or board scores, uh, wanted to live in one area and thought it, she had a deal with the program director and canceled about a, a dozen of the other interviews and, and ended up uh, not matching. So that, that's what happened to that 99%, and it's not due to our curriculum. Okay. Where are our students going to be rotating? Well, fortunately, as I mentioned before, I believe that there are sufficient number of clinical training opportunities here in the state. So unlike other schools, we don't have to send our students out to different states. Uh, I know that there's a lot of students from, like I said before, Arizona, Missouri, Kansas City, and, and various other places that send students out of state and they have to do their core rotations here. We're going to keep all of our third-year students here in Utah. Okay. So we have the different, the four major regions, and in each of these major regions, there is a regional director. Uh, Scott Moore is one of them um, here in the Weber area, but we have physicians that will oversee the 20 to 30 students in that region who will do all of their core clinical rotations in a one-hour driving distance. Okay. Each one of them will have a clinical coordinator to work on the schedules and do the credentialing and everything else. And then we have a few rural sites where we send students, about three to four students that want to do rural will practice and do their clinical training in these sites. Okay. Now, we do have something called the special tracks, and as the final slide, I'm kind of wrapping it up, bringing healthcare to the world through medical education. We do have a global medicine track and we have various other special tracks where students uh, in their first year, if they're in good academic standing after their first semester, they get to select a, a, a training track. They get additional hands-on training and more didactic training, lab training in certain areas that they may be interested in. Rural and wilderness medicine, military medicine, long-term care, um, leadership track and also a research track called the physician scientist track. So these are uh, our students and uh, I, I ended right on time because I did want, I did want to leave uh, about 15 minutes for some Q&A. Thank you very, very much. Yes, sir. Our preclinical curriculum was the, was the question. We have what's called a systems-based, clinically integrated spiral curriculum. Now, what that means, it's uh, systems-based, so they'll do cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, renal, 
and it's clinically integrated so that even in the first year when they're doing cardiovascular, they're not just learning uh, biochemistry and physiology. There will be cases that are thrown in there to correlate with patient care and case-based scenarios. Um, and then it's, in the first year, it's going to be normal, normal physiology, normal anatomy, normal physical exam. And then it spirals back around in the second year, and they'll do musculoskeletal, cardiology, renal. But this time, in the second year, it'll be pathology. It'll be pharmacology. It'll be assessment and management of disease. So they'll go through the systems twice. It's not a discipline-based curriculum, OBGYN, uh, pediatric, psych, in our first and second preclinical years. In the third years, yes, we have the traditional core, the sixth traditional core ones that other medical schools have as well. Yes, sir. Great question. So the physician scientist track program was, the question is, is it a DO, PhD program? No, it's, it's just um, they get special mentoring um, with, a, with a physician researcher um, and also PhD researchers. Now, a, in our medical school, it's a large medical school, 104,000 square feet, brand new, innovative, high-tech uh, school, but we collectively decided at the administrative level that we are not going to spend millions of dollars and, and put in a wet lab. Uh, we know that uh, that's not our strength. Our strength is going to be research in clinical education. It's going to be research in, in ultrasound and other innovative things. Um, us making a difference on genetic research, or lab research, you know, mice and other things, and cancer research, the University of Utah and other excellent institutions, they'll, they'll do that much better. So we've, in, we've uh, invested into simulation and, uh, and, and ultrasound education. So our students will start learning ultrasound in their first year of medical school, and by the time they graduate, um, they'll feel just as comfortable as an ultrasound probe as they would with an otoscope, ophthalmoscope just another diagnostic tool. So that physician scientist track, though, they, um, we, have an, uh, we have a research affiliation agreement and uh, facilities use agreement with our local Dixie State University to utilize their uh, wet labs, and so our students will have opportunity to do those wet lab research as well. Yes, sir. Is this a three-year or four-year program? Just like all medical schools in this country, it's two years preclinical, two years clinical, and then residency training. So it's a total of four years. Now, we do have a five-year pathway where um, highly advanced students, they apply for a fellowship track. So it's a teaching position. So the, um, we pay for two years of their tuition, um, but they will be part, of, kind of like a teaching assistant, lab assistant, and they'll help um, teach our first-year students as well. Yes, sir? Third and fourth year students don't get patient care experience in our building. Um, on, your campus. on our campus, however, we do have callbacks where we have uh, an OR simulation lab, ER simulation lab, L&D simulation lab, and so before they go on a, on a surgical rotation, they'll have to come back and do a one-week simulated surgical course, so they get that type of simulated training. Also, literally across the street from our school, we have a 108-bed skilled nursing facility called the Southern Utah Veterans Home. 25% um, of those patients are post-acute care patients, and all of our clinical faculty takes care of all the patients there. So our students, uh, from their first year, get a, you know, they get some exposure and experience in the early clinical education with those nursing home residents of post-acute care patients. Well, that's a separate, the nursing homes are taken care of by primary care physicians, and so that will be, um, it's not necessarily 
on our building on our campus, but it's literally across the street. It's behind our parking lot. And so um, the attending physician there that does inpatient medicine will take a couple of students, and that can be a rotation as well. Yes. The physician that we have, his name is Andy Nye, MD, and he recently retired a year ago um, from teaching uh, 20 years um, at the Indiana University School of Medicine. So he's been part of the residency faculty and taught their students and taught their residents. So he has a wealth of experience, and he just retired practice a year ago. So he's not currently seeing patients because it's hard to have a part-time surgical practice and, and, and teach at the med school. Absolutely. You're absolutely welcome. And um, there's no such thing as a, as a bad question. So if there's difficult questions, please, please ask it. Yes, sir. So our yearly tuition right now is around 54000 There's probably going to be, we're looking at about a 3% increase in that, and that's typical with medical schools across the nation. Uh, we st strategically... Uh, placed our tuition to be at the median of medical schools in the nation. Do we have housing available? Do we have housing available? What's interesting is when we first started our campus in Ivins in the St. George area, the rental opportunities was very, very low. So um, we thought that it was the right thing to do, the owner, so we convinced the ownership to create uh, student housing on our campus. Um, so we have, we're on 32 acres of land, and so three buildings were built, studios and two-bedroom apartments, fully furnished. What's interesting is that what we didn't, didn't expect is uh, we didn't get um, full occupancy, not even in one building, um, because uh, um, parents that had, that had some uh, money and availability bought houses for their children and uh, rented out the other rooms. Um, so lo lots of homeowners and uh, other community members started opening up their subleasing. So we have three buildings of apartment-style um, buildings that uh, still open, open occupancy. Yes, sir. So what advice would, would I give for pre-med students on the road to medical school? Um, interestingly enough, about half the people that came by our booth were parents um, asking that same question. They have children that want to go into medical school. Um, you know, there's right now, especially with the expanding scope of practice of mid-level providers, there's... Um, you know, a big decision that needs to be made by a lot of these uh, pre-med students now. Should I go the PA route? Three years, no residency, still come out making six figures? Or should I go the medical route? Um, should I become a nurse practitioner? So there's, so that needs to be figured out individually. Um, but it's really, you know, the, the most important thing is to get an interview. And once you get that interview, that's your opportunity. That's when we really, really, really start you know, looking at the applications and, and everything else. We do a holistic review of, an, of the application. We want to see that you had high level, um, you know, besides GPA, we want to see you have community service. We want to see that um, you're interested in medicine, so you've done some medical stuff, you know, volunteered at a hospital. Um, but the GPA and the MCAT score is, is very, very important because if you don't meet our minimum threshold, our minimum threshold of MCAT is 500. 
if they don't meet that minimum threshold, uh, by the way, 500 is the 50 percentile uh, on the MCAD. If they don't meet that minimum threshold, the application doesn't even pop up on our uh, application screen. And each school will have different thresholds. Ours, we set ours a little bit higher. Um, so it's really focusing on your GPA in, in undergraduate medical school, studying hard for the MCATs, uh, and making sure that you do community service and in leadership positions. Uh, one of the most common comments that I get um, from interviewers that we have both MD and DO faculty um, and both MD and DO physicians, when they interview our students and see their applications, the most common thing they tell me is, wow, these kids are so impressive. If I'm applying to medical school these days, I don't think I'll get accepted. I mean, I, these students are Division I athletes. These are scholars and valedictorians, um, even at our osteopathic medical school. Um, so very, very impressive students, but um, I don't think it has really changed much from the old medical school um, uh, advice and, and, and now. It's you gotta do well in your undergraduate. Now, what's interesting is if you looked at our, uh, if you looked at the numbers, uh, 53,000 applicants, 21,000 plus matriculants, the acceptance rate is about 40%. That's actually not bad if you think about it. Uh, we know it's hard to get into medical school, but the acceptance rate is about 40%. And I don't think um, it's because it's easier to get into medical school. If anything, it's probably harder to get into medical school. But I think the, the pre-health advisors are doing a much better job of, of advising their students, undergraduate students, and saying, you know, with your GPA and MCAT, I would not waste your money on application fees to medical school. You may want to consider a different uh, health route. So the attrition rate is approximately 8%. Um, so in Colorado, coming up in Colorado, um, and that's the interesting thing about um, accreditation. Remember I said we were approved for 150 students and approved for 125. The accreditation agency allows us an 8% overage of matriculants to account for attrition. So in Colorado, we've matriculated 162 students, expecting about 8% of them will not graduate. And it's really more than just failing out. So anyway, so we'll have about 150 graduating on Saturday. And it's really not, it's complicated. There's a lot of leave of absences, and the vast majority of them are due to mental health issues. So when a student does poorly on a test and we interview the student, you know, is it, do we need test taking skills or prep? Um, it's always some form of anxiety, depression, and you know, all, <laughs> I kind of chuckle at this, but uh, um, newly diagnosed ADHD all of a sudden, yeah. But, but a lot of them is really depression and anxiety related. Okay. Yes, sir. Excellent question. I think the underlying question is how much of the, you know, of the rotations that are in the third years do the students have to go out and do the legwork and find their own rotations? For us, it's absolutely no. Other schools, it's yes. But our school at Rocky Vista is no. Our students are told it's forbidden. They are not to ask physicians for rotations. Um, if they find and talk to a physician that's interested in being a preceptor, what they do is transfer that information to, to Scott Moore or regional director and make it a doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication um, because we also, you know, want to make sure that uh, the physician is also a quality physician uh, as well. So students are not allowed to make their own rotations. And so our clinical coordinators working with our regional directors, they will make the student's schedule for them every month. Second question. So, much earlier in my career, I, I was in academic classes, residency, and medical exam. And early in my, uh, my career here in, in Ogden, I frequently had uh, DO students uh, working with me as a preceptor over time. My practices demand that your activities 
That's an excellent question. And the, to, to, to summarize is, you know, in, in our current practice of medicine, productivity and efficiency is extremely important. And what we hear from preceptors the most is students slow me down. Um, so how are we addressing this? Um, first of all, we understand this scenario. And we don't want students to slow you down. As a matter of fact, if anything, we would like the students to help you in your office to help, help the efficiency, help the patient care satisfaction, help with uh, office quality improvement projects, and help them teach you and teach others. So the way we're working with this is our philosophy is we don't expect our community preceptors to teach, necessarily teach, our students. Right now in the, in, in the computer world, all the information, medical education is out there. 98% um, of all the world's information is now digitized, mostly online, mostly for free. So your job as preceptor should not be the transmission of this information. It's out there. So what we are asking our preceptors to do is to allow our students to have clinical opportunities, actual patient care opportunities that you just supervise and make sure that the patient doesn't get hurt. And throw in some pearls and wisdoms here and there. So specifically, let's take uh, it, surgery for that matter. So we have uh, a general surgeon, faculty member at, at our school who is the clerkship director. So the clerkship director uh, manages the syllabus and a curriculum. There's a, there's a surgery curriculum that all of our third year students must do. There's a curriculum for every one of the core um, rotations. And so these, so the students know exactly what they need to read, what quizzes that they got to do, what presentations that they have to do, and our clerkship directors will meet with them via online Zoom uh, once a week uh, for two hours and do lectures, listen to case presentations, go over certain things. So they do the education part. Our community preceptors supervise, teach them the humanism of medicine, the art of practice, um, and we ask our community preceptors to hold our students accountable for their curriculum by asking them, all right, teach me what you learned yesterday. Okay? So the burden of teaching is not on you, um, it's really on the clerkship directors, but more importantly, it's on our students. Our goal as medical educators now is to transform our medical students to be self-learners, lifelong self-learnings, just the way you guys are doing it right now. Um, I'm looking at Scott as the moderator. One more question? One more question? Well, thank you very much for your engagement. I appreciate it.